Welcome back. It's now time for us to talk about the state of the polity. And you see, a lot has been going on. And, of course, this growing concern whether there will be a nationwide protest from August, about some weeks within the month of August, uh, given the level of hunger and, you know, the difficulty people are feeling and facing in their daily lives and activities. So uh, we want to look at all of that as far as the issue of leadership and followership is concerned uh, in our policy. And we've been joined in the program uh, by Dr. Taiwo Ojo. He's a strategic leadership consultant, member International Leadership Association, and the CEO of Kish Global Consultant. Thank you, sir, for coming. Thank on the you program. for having me. I'd like you to characterize what is playing out in Nigeria on two ends. From the leadership end, mm -hmm. looking at it from top down, yeah. and then from the followership end, looking oh. at it from bottom up. Once again, thank you for having me, and thanks for all you do at channels. You know, um, um, Nigeria is a peculiar situation now. It's a peculiar issue, and um, the challenges that we're facing is not only in Nigeria, it's global. I just came back, and... Uh, there's something I've been seeing across different uh, cultures that I've been going to, and um, it's a tough time. High inflationary pressure, low purchasing power, anger across the board, especially among all our young people, and uh, because they're losing trust in leadership, you know, they lose trust in leadership. But bring it back home. I know it's a tough time for everyone. Elites, masses, everybody is feeling the punch now. but. I, 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 as, as, as a policy shaper, I, I don't dwell on politics or emotions or the only thing I just want to bring to the table is just for us to give the government time. I know it's tough. People don't want to listen to that because I know people have the right to protest. It's a democracy, so everyone is free. If you go to America, you see so many things happening there. But it's a tough time, but we need to encourage ourselves as a, as a people, as a nation, Wherever we are, it's tough everywhere. And one thing that is lacking in the room is the virtue of love. Whether from the followership, whether from the leadership, whether even in the midst of all those challenges, I we our brother's keeper? No. And Nigeria problem has been in existence for a very long time. I remember when we were in primary schools in the 80s, it's the same issue, you know, IMF issue, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same issue, and it's the same human being that's in the midst of this issue. So I just want us to look at the behavioral change, because what we are doing now is we are focusing on the outcome. Outcome, that's what we're focusing on. We're not focusing on the process. We are not focusing on who we are, our own identity as a people. Because a typical Nigeria is living with these vices of hate and anger. I understand the challenges are enormous, but we need to just come down and try to face the truth because our focus mostly is on the government. Good, no problem, because they are our leaders, they are our political leaders. But from the family angle too, that's where the problem is. What are we doing from the home front? Because everyone that comes from the home front is the value system that you demonstrate when you go outside. And all those people in leadership position in the political office, they come from somewhere. So do we go back to the roots and try to fix the problem? So I know it's a generic issue, it's a tough time for everyone, but we need to look inward and see how we can salvage the situation that we have at our hand, especially in Nigeria. So now. the argument is uh, always the fact that the, the, some of the things that the government does in terms of moral hazard that yeah. comes to them, which is what I want you to speak yeah. to, is it that Nigerians were too hopeful, or this is what played out in 2023 that is affecting us, and now convoluted by the fact that government is saying, be patient, we're working, and then we're seeing expenditure that looks mm -hmm. ludicrous yeah. in the eyes of the public? Yeah. It's, it's leadership by example. I, 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 will, I don't want to pass a blame game on the government alone, leaving the, the, the masses or the followership to. All of us are in it. You, when... What is lacking in the room is empathy, whether it's Obasanjo, whether it's Yaradoa, whether it's Jonathan, whether it's Buhari, whether it's Tinubu now. And Nigerians have this big session on magic and miracle because we are religious people. We might not be godly, but we are religious. And any society that is religious, 
development might not, you might not really see development. If you go to the Middle East, they are very godly. They, they, they practice Islam, but they're very godly. If you go to the Western world, most are Christian, they are very godly. They don't dwell on religion. But in Sub-Saharan Africa, we focus more on religion. And when you focus more on religion, most of those virtues will be thrown out of the bus. There was a difference <laughs> being religious and being godly, just to be clear. Being religious is just a ritual. You just go to church, mosque, or your, your deity, and just do the normal thing that you do, which we call laws. But being godly is for you to walk on that grace, to have those virtue that comes from within you. You can't manufacture it. It, go, it comes through a process and it's character formation. And it takes me back to the behavioral change that mm -hmm. I talked about before. Mm -hmm. How are we behaving in our individual inner circles that nobody sees? Mm -hmm. Because you leave a family to come to the world. You know, I travel a lot and I see so many Nigerians, so many Africans. It's the same problem everywhere. Well, I I'm just wondering, wondering why um, the virtues of godliness are scarce in the reflection of... Um, you know, the values yeah, of leadership, yeah. which is the reason for this question. I, and I noted that you said that perhaps we should present more time mm. uh, to the government, but I'm wondering how much more time, yeah. uh, if we now narrow the issues down to, um, you know, the social contract between the leaders and the led, yeah. uh, which is, you know, commitment to provision of uh, lives, uh, security of life and mm. property. Yeah. And of course, a conducive environment for you know the people to thrive right. and express their dreams yeah. and pursuits. Mm -hmm. Go to food. As far back as the um, administration of former President Muhammadu Buhari, mm -hmm. the WFP had projected that um, an, a good number of Nigerians, millions actually, would be food insecure by 2024. Yeah. And you know that was enough time for the administration to prepare, even though it was handing over to a new one. Mm -hmm. But here we are today, the f price of food commodities are rising. Mm. And we have another report by the UN that 82 million Nigerians will be food insecure by the end of this year. So how much of this, you know, um, caught the leadership unprepared? Mm. And how much time should we still give leadership? You know, you know the, the greatest problem we have, because I've been following our democratic uh, experiment since 99, the greatest problem we have is the preparation. You know, we speak a lot of grammars and stories, conferences, but the greatest problem we have is the doing. You know, this food crisis, we saw it coming. You know, during the government of former president, the insecurity issue, you know, I was looking at the Benue insecurity issues. Insecurity is tied to economy. You know, uh, there are some factors that we used to define how the world runs. You know, we call them steep factors, the social factors, the social cultural factors, that's our society, our value system, and et cetera. You have the technology, which is a big ball in the room now. You have the environmental factor, issue of climate change, and et cetera. You have the economic factor and the political factors. The economy and politics is the biggest baby in the room. And if, if, if I take us back to the election period last year, Buhari, you know, the, those seeds were sown. You understand? And the insecurity ran all through three, four years. Nobody was, people were not able to go to farm. Now, the chicken has finally come home to roast. So my, my, my advice to government is, what are they doing? What is the Minister of Agriculture doing? What are the cabinet members doing? I was talking to someone yesterday, I said, they need to rejig the cabinet because Nigerians will have the best hand to support. You will have the best, and you know, I, I'm not, I, I'm a political, but I remember during Obasanjo time. You know, the economy, people were coming back from abroad, come back home to, to, to support the system. But now it's the opposite, because people are looking for a better life. So people go abroad, they do so many things that they get there, and they are shocked that this is not what we, but those things are normal. Mm -hmm. But now come back to government. We need to come back and face reality. Right. It's a tough time now, but empathy is what is lacking in the room. Well, uh, I'm, I must give it to you, really. Uh, there's a calmness about you with which you approach these things. But, you know, it's been said that everybody's protesting at this point. Mm. Not just, <laughs> everybody's not carrying black card, but there's a sort of yeah. protest. Whether you go to the market and you realize that what you bought for, <laughs> the crate of egg you bought for mm. 3,000 naira a few days back mm. is now 4,600. Mm. You protest. Say, so why? What's going on? Yeah. Or you mm. trying to buy something and yeah. it's, you know, 
but everybody's sort of protesting yeah. at different levels mm -hmm. now. So I, I don't think uh, there's no protest happening right now. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're waiting for that. No, there's <laughs> protests going on yeah. already. But here's my point. So you, you've talked about uh, rejigging the cabinet, yeah. uh, for example. So you expect that some ministers should be taken out, mm. some should be uh, maybe moved, yeah. and uh, new ones yeah. reintroduced. Well, again, if that will be done, is yet another thing entirely. Mm. But what more should government be doing? What we have right now seems like a silence. Mm. I think for a lot of Nigerians, the last promise or the last message in the, they can maybe remember is what you have retreated. Give us more time. Yeah. Be patient with mm. us. And there's light at the end of the uh, tunnel. Right. This would yield Pass. fruits eventually. Mm. But that is something they're used to. They can mm. almost predict. So what more should government be doing in terms of engagement and actually action? The House of Reps, for example, said they've cut their salary 50%. <laughs> that was met with skepticism <laughs> from Nigerians. Rather than applaud them, a lot of people were angry. angry. So obviously, they're not getting uh, this formula right. So yeah. present us a formula that mm. they should follow through in terms of engagement and action. Action. You know, uh, the funny thing about governance in Nigeria is, you know, they, they listing, but they, 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 they wear what you're talking about, but to do is always a problem. And there's something we call knowing doing gap. Knowing doing gap, even among we academics, you know, you know so much theory. Bringing those theory to practical, that is where you're stuck. So it's called knowing doing gap. So the government, they know what to do, but doing it, because Nigeria is a complex system. If you run a business, if you run a business, look at Elijah Likodangote. Look at all those things that are happening about the refinery. It's a complex system that sometimes you wonder, the people in government, what are they doing? When you get there, you face the same challenges that they are facing. So as a strategist, we hardly condemn anyone, we hardly blame people. But my simple advice to those people in, 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 in leadership, we focus too much on the president. That's our greatest bane. The president is powerful. I know Nigeria president is the most powerful in the world maybe because of so many things that he controls or she controls. But are we focusing on the sublation as the state, the local government? I know the local government has not been functioning for over 30 years, but the state governments, the state governors, most of them are not doing anything. I know it's tough for, it's tough for most of them, but they are not being followed to see the outcome of what they are doing. So what, what, what is my advice to the government? Simple. We have issues. The president came on board during a tough time. He removed subsidy. Good. The planning was not well thought out. You now did unification of the foreign you know, exchange, which was good, but we are not producing anything. So even Japan, that is a producing nation, they used close to $60 billion to support yen. Japan, they did not unify. You understand? I'm not saying the economic issues are falling sometimes, but you have done those things, no problem. Now people are now feeling the heat. So what do you do? You lead by example. Focus on lead cabinet, because when people no, the government had done some things. They banned travels. They did some, you know, and good. But that cabinet is large. It's too large. If you were to fit it in a room, maybe you need two rooms. To fit it's too large. Cabinet. Just focus on the one in the constitution, one per state. And we have best hand. We have, but, you know, Nigeria is a political chess game. You can't explain. And it's been like that since the 60s. Should we, should we begin to do some calling out? Because it's not, Nigerians are becoming a, a lot more impatient, just like Kyle yeah. said. And the worry in, mm. in the minds of a lot of discerning Nigerians mm. is there's, a, there's much, there's this much you can do to restrain people yeah. with, oh, DSS is saying they will mm. hijack this. Mm. People are encoding yeah. and they are looking at, you're using all kinds of institutions mm. to stifle them. Yeah. If we don't allow them to express themselves, something wrong could go, yeah. could happen. So my calling out here is as a leader, yeah. you've mentioned something quite strategic. Mm. There are ministers who don't even know their names. Mm not even talk of the ministry they represent. Yeah. There are governors who have run this country and they failed to use the right word. Yeah. They, they were terrible at their performance. Yeah. There are governors running states now that will fail. I'm not saying they <laughs> fail, they will they fail. Have, yeah. So do we have a capacity problem as well? Uh, Nigeria, Nigeria as a country do not have a capacity problem. No, I'm talking about the people in power. The people in power, no, I'm just talking yeah. about political leadership. The problem is the system and the structure of the government that they run. 
Now, let me bring it up. You are 45, is it 45 or 46 40, ministers? 48, it's supposed to be between no. 46 to 48. Yes, I know. Most of them are political, you know, they just to take care of them. But hopefully there will be one year. Drop like 80% of them. 80% of them, if you want to do well. There are so many brilliant minds in Nigeria that can help you. Because our problem, I mean, is so peculiar. It's not only Nigeria. Anyway, it's tough everywhere. Look at Kenya, look at South Africa. But... Their cabinet, the government, the cabinet is lean. So sometimes when people are complaining, you know, Nigeria, they've been going through a lot for years, but they are not seeing their, their political leaders. I call them political leaders. I'm not calling them leaders. Mark my word. I'm not calling them leaders because everyone is a leader from your own, where, from your family system. You are a father, you are a mother, you are a brother, you are a sister, you are no, a leader. None of us were elected. But none of us have yes, the opportunity to, to be in that position of authority. What we use Nigeria's revenue for. for. So that's, I think that's why you are trying to. Yes. So that's why I call them political leaders. And they are voted for, whether through credible means or the other side. But the most important thing is we need to focus more on them. And secondly, my advice to government don't stop protests. People have the right to protest, especially when you have over 80% of your population, young people. Young people are very agile, technology-wise, and they, they, they don't really have patience because they want to see results. They are not like our generation that have this patience to hold on, to manage, to... They, their own is instant gratification. They want to see changes so that when you go abroad, you see them, they're everywhere. When there's any issue, they come out to protest. Everyone, they have the right to protest, but you need to be strategic about how you come about those protests so that people don't hijack the protest. Because the, the, the situation now is very tense. Hunger is the biggest bane, which is mm. tied to economy. And speaking of, um, you know, responses to these issues in order to prevent a mm. protest, Jeffrey was talking about whether it is a challenge of capacity that mm. we have. Mm. Um, you know, there, there were calls for, you know, the invocation of that uh, 1970 Price Control Act in okay. order to regulate the price of commodities. And in fact, you know, a senior advocate of Nigeria had secured a court order mm. uh, to compel that government, you know, intervenes in the reduction mm. of prices. And, you know, we didn't see that happen. Mm. The president committed not to doing so. Mm. But we've also seen that the administration by itself has said we are going to give a 180-day window for import-free uh, uh, tariff-free importation. Yeah. So if my question is, if government can by itself, you know, suspend its own laws, you know, to allow for 180-day mm. um, tariff-free importation, mm. why can't it intervene in the regulation of price in order to show capacity and, you know, the willingness, the political will, mm. you know, to intervene mm. in that space? That'll be 150 days. Yeah, yeah, 150 days, yeah. You know, very, very brilliant question, Bukola. When you operate in a survival mode, you know, so many levels of, the mass low level of needs. So let, let, me, let me bring us back to the two lowest level of survival and security. That is where most people from our culture, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Confucian Asia, operate from. And I tie to, let me compare us to Indians and Chinese, because I don't want to compare us to the Western world. Mm -hmm. Let me compare us to Indians and Chinese, as you know, they come to the Western world to study. I did my PhD in the US. They come to the Western world to study. They finish their study. They go back home to support their people. We call some people ABC, American born Chinese. They go to Hong Kong to support their country. They, they go back home. The same India. India do not cut ties. And we are both clannish based. In my last new book, Umbutu Leadership, we are all the same, we have the same value system, we have the same clannish, the societal support, family support system. So what is wrong with we African? We go abroad, we don't come back to help our country. That is the problem. We're looking for comfort. Abroad is not built within a day, and it's a credit system. So you can't move from point A to 10 in a day. You, you could take it 20 years. So what am I saying? Can we behave like the Chinese and the India? There are challenges in India. It's worse than Nigeria. But the media, their own media, they try to 
cover so many things. Well, but, they don't have food challenges, at least. In fact, they said that in India, there's too much food, <laughs> <laughs> so much food that they're obese. <laughs> and that's a population because they found a way mm. to look at their food production challenge mm. and fix it. Mm. In fact, in terms of health yeah. as well, yeah. health to tourism, a lot of Nigerians have to travel there. Yeah. Guess what? <laughs> Majority of the drugs we even get into Nigeria India. are produced in India. India. So yeah. yes, they may have their challenges, mm. but they've been able to look at those challenges and say, mm. we are going to fix this Think in this, spite yeah. of, I mean, their population should be a yeah. burden, but they've transformed that into mm. a blessing. We can go on and on, but yeah. there's a saying in my language, if you keep comparing children, <laughs> you might be tempted to beat yours to death. But yeah. you've talked about uh, how we should have empathy yeah. across board. Mm. Some will say the burden is more on the leaders yeah. because yeah. naturally they have more responsibility. Yeah. They have more powers. They have, mm. you know, basically uh, a longer end of the stick yeah. to hold on to. But I want you to speak to Nigerians, yeah. young Nigerians. Mm. Uh, maybe you added some extra age by saying eighty mm. percent. Some say we are seventy percent mm. young people. Some say maybe even fifty yeah. percent. We've not conducted a census, so we don't even know. We're not <laughs> sure. Yeah. But I want you to speak to young Nigerians mm. this morning because for a lot of them, they've not had it good in Nigeria. I know, and that is even putting it mildly. Mm. That's why a lot of them want to move, move. to that part of the world. Mm. Older generations had it. They will tell you, when they were in school, mm. this was how much they were buying a tin of milk. Yeah. They were giving them food in university. Yeah. Laundry was free. Mm. Young people were like, no, I've had to struggle for mm. everything I have. So speak to young Nigerians this morning. Mm. Um, it's going to be a tough one, but you yeah. seem to have that calmness. Mm. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know you know what you want to do. Also, I'm part of the young Nigerians. OK, anyway, we'll, so we'll admit you. We're part of the youth. So just uh, an appeal just to bring the word of hope, you know, I'm not saying renew hope because I'm not political. Hope, you know, I know the young people, they are looking at what is going to happen to me in the next five, 10 years. That's the kind of people they are. They are not seeing anything. And you go to the Western world, you can try to fulfill your potentials and do what you want to do anytime, anywhere. You know, the only thing I can say is because they don't want to hear story. The government gives them story. They are not interested in story. They want to see how you want to make those things happen. Firstly, by living by example, because it's the exemplary leadership that is lacking. If the young people see that the leaders are also starving themselves, they are not living large, they are not buying jeeps and all those things. Those things are they will they will fall they will fall into line. And the biggest problem we have is this power of self. Whether you are Caucasian, you are blacks, you are anyhow, we are all the same. You you we we hardly undo power well. But because in the Western culture and in the developed nation, they, they, there's something they call consequences. If you do anything wrong, you'll be punished. In our culture here, if you do anything wrong, you, are, you, might, not be, you might probably get away with it. And <clears throat> Nigerians, we forget things so easily. We move on to the next thing immediately. That's the way we are. So my candid advice to the young people is, I, I can't say patient because I'm not occupying any political position. But what I can say to them is, just to hang on a bit. I know it's tough. It's tough. And let's continue to talk with, with the people in position of authority, with the government, to say our mind and see how we can be a part of the solution to the problem. So just to add, so that you can, you can mm. also add this to it. Mm. Nigerians mm. are traumatized, to say the least. Mm. There is no record anywhere, mm. let's begin with 1999, 25 mm. years down the line, mm. that has shown that Nigerian government promised a better life mm. and delivered a better life. Mm. Olusegun Basenjo, mm. Yaradwa, mm. Good Luck Jonathan, mm. Buh Muhammad Buhari, mm. and now President Bola Tinubu. I'm talking about the pricing yes. keep increasing mm. with all the variables. When someone, because I'm speaking to you as a leader now, mm. as a leadership expert, mm. yeah. when a person or a group of people are that traumatized, yeah. What level of clarity is required from the leadership? Because mm. right now, it's a question of clarity. What the government is offering, as Kayoda said, mm. is hope. Hope is not clarity. <laughs> it's not clarity, just, you know, it's not. What is the kind of clarity you will suggest to the government that they should give to the people? I'll give you an example. Mm. Price of eggs, how much now? 200 to 300 4, naira. 4,600. We, we met it at uh, 50 naira mm. or 20 naira. Even if this government takes it back to 50 naira, they've mm. not improved our lives. They yeah. just took us back to where we're used to. Mm. So it's a challenge. It's How a should they communicate? You know, communication is, is also a problem, you know. Um, you know, across uh, the leadership, uh, communication is a big deal. But I understand the issue of pricing. You know, I, I, I'm taking us back to the behavioral change. As Nigerians, because we focus more on 
on mammon. We focus on what to gain, what to benefit. So nobody can control what you do. The prices are not stable. And it's because we are still on that survival niche. Everybody in this uh, culture is on survivor, including the president, including the, the African research man, because you are striving to get in and do those things, and those things refuse to go away. So if I'm the government, you know, like you said, we can't give hope. Hope is invisible. People want to hold on to something like an outcome. So how do you do those things? You are in a position of authority. You have ministers, you have cabinet. Live by example and face the reality. We need to say the truth. Who are we as Nigerians? What is our population? The data. Focus on the data. Let us even know who we are first. The true, you know, our credible, <laughs> the data. Are we 200 million? Are we 150 million? Those things, you need to address them. Because if you don't address those things first, if you are bringing any economic jargons, it doesn't solve any problem. Let us go back to the basis, go back to the foundation. It's not late. Let us talk and face our problem headlong. It can be resolved. But the problem is leadership by example with love. Not only across leadership, even among we followers, love is the engine room for any development. How do we douse ethnicity and tribalism? It's tough because, uh, you know, among those countries that British colonized, you know, it's only Nigeria that is running an executive form of government. They all do parliamentary, whether South Africa, whether India, whether Pakistan, people that are all like us, Brazil, Turkey, etc. Can we look at the form of our government? Because we are different people. Can we go back to the region? It might not be region. Okay. We can discuss and see where we can get those advantage to solve, mm -hmm. because the problem won't go away. Right. Is, is a recurring issue, and it keeps coming back to anyone that is the right. future of authority, they will face that challenge. Dr. Zawo Ojo, thank you so much. We must appreciate it. We're totally out of time. Strategic Leadership Consultant, Member International Leadership Association, and CEO Kish Global Consultant. Thank you for having me. Thank you thank so you much. You thank did. you so much for coming on the program. All right, uh, we will take a quick break. When we come back, we get to meet our next guest. You like this one? Join us again. <laughs>